Hi guys, Megalithic Maiden here, and I'm going to do a short talk on symbols. The measure of man, or temple in man, woman. Now this video series will be long by necessity, but doing it this way is necessary, because the symbolism is often layered and complex. I'll start with the ancient Egyptian goddess Seshat. She has many epithets, but my favorite description of her is mistress of the house of architects. And for sure, she is the one whom takes measure. This is a layered meaning, of course, which the ancients did expertly and elegantly. Sasha was also known as the mistress of the house of books because she looked after the library of the gods and was patron of all earthly libraries. She was also patron of all forms of writing, including accounting and census taking. According to one myth, it was actually Sesha who invented writing, but it was her husband Thoth who taught the people to write. It is interesting to note that she is the only female character who is actually depicted in the act of writing. A number of other women were depicted holding the scribe's palette and brush, indicating that they could write, but not actually engaged in the act of writing. As mistress of the house of architects, she would no doubt have access to the tools required of such a title, and I will touch on this shortly. The most prominent monument at Saqqara is the Steppe Pyramid of Djoser, first king of the Third Dynasty, 2650 to 2575 BC estimated. This structure, believed to have been designed by a high official named Imhotep, is said to be the first pyramid and the earliest example of large-scale stone construction in Egypt. As such, I believe there would be some evidence of Seshat depicted there. The Steppe Pyramid stands at the heart of a large ritual complex, which covers 37 acres. A massive buttress limestone wall of a royal palace within a number of different structures once stood. At Saqqara, the ancient measuring and surveying tool used in the construction of the Steppe Pyramid itself is shown carved in relief. The bottom image portrays a Groma surveying tool, which is a tool of Seshats. Now many people have said that this carving is a depiction of stars, and indeed it is, but this is not the only thing it represents. The ancients were masters of elegance in their carvings because they used layered meanings. These dual meanings meant less effort was used in the carving of hard stone. The star is also a groma, and both relate to Seshat. As mentioned before, she was known as the mistress of the house of architects, and she surveyed not only the earth, but the stars and the other heavenly bodies as well. If you still find it hard to believe that what is being shown is a groma, then please see the image comparison of a known Roman groma from the grave of an ancient mason or surveyor shown here on the right. And as you can see here, the toll for measuring also doubles as the symbol of the ancient Egyptian deity Seshat. Let's delve into this further. We can see this roughly made groma, top center, was found during an excavation in the Fayum province of Egypt in 1899. Early surveyors' instruments such as this were useful only on flat terrain and for setting a limited range of angles. With the groma, distant objects were marked out against the position of the stones in a horizontal plane. This groma is thought to have been used to set out the lines of roads at right angles in the 1st and 2nd centuries, but was used much, much earlier. In combination with other tools, one would be able to survey and build very precise architecture.
This next image shows a cylinder sill from the Mesopotamian area. And we have a lot of cylinder sills that come from that region. And a sad thing about this is that they are often confused about what people think they are saying. What I see here is an elite deity on the left sitting down explaining how to survey out a structure. And on the right, the three individuals are holding surveying tools. And it is just quite clear if you know what you're looking for when you finally see it. This is a surveying teaching moment or instructions given. And it is the same symbol, if you look at all the images here, follow the red arrows down. Uh, this is part of Seshat's symbol. She was a deity involved in surveying. And again, here is another slide showing a very famous cylinder sill. And it is also showing building and construction happening, surveying tools are at play. And the groma, which is clearly, you're able to see it as a groma when you have gromas shown beside either of the image in the middle. It's plain as day once you know what you're looking at. So let's continue on with this. The bottom left corner shows an ancient groma in use. And please note in the same image, too, Stakes being hammered into the ground. Now please look at the large middle portrayal image of Seshat and see she holds these two objects in her hands. As she was described, I believe these objects are again dual imagery showing both the writing tools and measuring tools. Please note again the stretching of the cord ceremony which Seshat was traditionally always involved in, the surveying aspect of this. As such an important goddess, Seshat no doubt would have been revered and honored and involved in the building of the Great Pyramid on the Giza Plateau. If we want to look at her symbol a little more closely, and realize that the Great Pyramid itself has eight sides, we can see that from above the symbol is the pyramid itself, the points of it. And this is so interesting to me. I really am struck by the fact that if any other goddess had any major part to play on the Giza Plateau, I am 100% sure it would have been Sashat. I'll speak on Sashat a bit more. She's the deity associated with the feline, and in fact was often shown wearing the skin of one which I believe also is part of her imagery relating to the heavens and her ability to measure not only the stars, but to design, survey, and oversee megalithic constructions such as the Great Pyramids and others. The spots on the feline pelts represented stars, but more than that. This old form of the Promethean goddess has been around for many millennia. She was the keeper of the sacred fire. She's been called by many names throughout time by many different cultures. She was a bringer of knowledge, a goddess of fertility, and keeper of the sacred fire, as mentioned, among many other things. It would not seem far-fetched to me to believe that the Sphinx is itself somehow related to the Great Goddess. If any deity deserved to be prominently shown and honored on the plateau, it indeed would have been the Goddess of the Builders. I 
I can easily say that many of the tools held by the elite in ancient times were related to surveying and were probably measurement tools, though having lost their meaning over time to us. For example, let us talk about the Waz Scepter. The large image above showing several human figures is a representation of land measurement on the wall of a tomb at Thebes from approximately 1400 BC, showing head and rear chain men measuring a grain field with what appears to be a rope with knots or marks at uniform intervals. The Wa Scepter was a symbol that appeared often in relics, art, and hieroglyphics associated with the ancient Egyptian religion. It appears as a stylized animal head at the top of a long, straight staff with a forked end. Scepters were depicted as being carried by gods, pharaohs, and priests. It was both a measurement tool and a symbol of power. It was part of the rod and the ring, also known as the shin ring, and the symbol evolved into an elongated form we now refer to as the cartouche, whom held the names of the elite only. It was eternal life. These tools of measurement gave humans the ability to successfully farm and sustain themselves, which effectively extended and improved their lives. If you had the knowledge of measurement, then you had power. Now it is possible that in the very distant past, there was an original goddess related to things of measurement that became splintered over time, breaking off into many goddesses. The ancient goddess Seshet, Bat, and Hathor were probably all one and the same originally. I'll touch on Hathor and Bat in a moment. She's been called many names throughout time, and may have even been androgynous. As previously mentioned, I believe there is solid evidence to show that there was indeed one original goddess dating back to and beyond the time of Gobekli Tepe in Turkey, whom was a surveyor, measurer, and much more. She spanned the globe and knew no restrictions to the width and breadth of her reach. We see evidence of her everywhere. Now, Bat or Bata was an ancient Egyptian cow goddess associated with Upper Egypt. She was originally a deification of the Milky Way, which was compared to the pools of a cow's milk. Her name is the feminine form of the word Ba, the name of one of the major elements of the soul. She was associated with the Ankh, the symbol of life or breath, and with the Sistrum, which was also associated with Hathor. Her cult center was in Sheshesh, the seventh gnome of Upper Egypt, known as the Mansion of the Sistrum. It is possible that Hathor and Bat were once and the same because of their similar aspects. Here again is the stylized Groma from a piece of Proto-Egyptian pottery showing the Groma, the known Roman Groma, on the right. The goddess of measurement spread around the world with the symbols often remaining the same, but her names changed and her aspects evolved. The above image shows the goddess Bridget's cross. Bridget, or the exalted one, was the Irish goddess of spring, fertility, and life. The cross of Bridget was traditionally set over doorways and windows to protect the home from harm. Bridget was the master of both healing and smithing. Her holiday, Imbolc, was held on February 1st and marked the midpoint of winter. Many of Ireland's wells and waterways were devoted to her. She was a member of the Tuatha de Danann and the Bridget or Brid name likely refers to the goddess's connection to sunlight and fire, but may also be related to the dawn goddesses across the Indo-European world. 
Bridget is derived from the Proto-Indo-European root for to rise or high. Bridget was also known as the goddess of the wells due to her connection to wells and waterways. She was he a healing figure, a fertility figure, represented motherhood, but also she represented passion and fire and heat. Bridget's domain over fertility and motherhood included not only mortals and gods, but animals as well. In Ireland, at the ancient site of Newgrange, the symbol of the goddess was built into the site in the form of a corbelled ceiling. You can look at the cross of Bridget on the left and easily see the center design is the same as a section of ceiling inside the sacred structure. It is both the container of sacred fire and the container of water, both needed to bring forth life. The same thing is represented across the globe and repeated, wherein the design of a particular deity type related to architecture is portrayed. You have only to look at the ancient artifacts to clearly see this. The temple was in man and always has been. The same thing occurs in Malta, where the bountiful and fertile mother deity's shape was the outline for the temple structure itself. In the UK, this was also done in the ancient long barrel constructions. The first image on the left is Bella's Nap, a Neolithic chambered long barrow situated on Cleve Hill near Cheltenham in Withcombe in Gloucestershire. The next image is Park Labreus and is another example of a female form Neolithic chambered tomb. And it was discovered in 1869 by workmen digging for the road stone. It is one of the best preserved in this part of Wales. The two protrusions around the entrances of Bellis, Knapp, and Park Lebreos display the typical style of the so-called Cotswold Severn long barrows of the region. Extensive excavations at Park Lebreos reveal the bones of at least 40 individuals. Roughly 70 feet in length, the tomb has a narrow passageway leading to four small chambers lined with upright stones. The tomb was probably once covered by large capstone slabs, but these have disappeared long ago. These types of female formed tombs are also found in Ireland and even in Sardinia. In Sardinia, they are very skillfully executed and explained as being in the form of a bull's head, which is almost always associated as being an aspect of the ancient goddess. I believe these styles are the same, just done with a different signature, if you will, but they relate to the same thing being portrayed. There's a bit more that I would like to discuss, and this is the fact that the chambers in many of the long barrows that are built in the female form also have the same style of chambers. This occurs from Sardinia to the UK and even beyond. In fact, some of these chambers are an exact match, which is intriguing considering the distance between the sites. Now we can even expand these investigations further still by exploring parts of Brittany. For example, at Les Pierre Plates in France, we can see the same important female form carved into the passage tomb. This tomb is beautiful and is located on the beach and is shaped in the form of a cane. I was quite astounded when I first visited the site, even though it was a bit waterlogged. It was still amazing. And it was amazing 
because of the carvings located on the slabs which made up the walls of the structure. These slabs of stones were decorated with the almost blueprint-like images of the mother goddess tombs found in the UK and other countries. Interesting, at Les Pierre Platts, the carving to the far left also seems to show not only the layout of the megalithic mother goddess tomb shape, but the chamber designs as well. Why is it this way? Why, why did they do this? These are questions we need to think about. The belief of this mother goddess and her three aspects played a large part in the lives of the ancients, with good reason, too, as these aspects in the form of the youthful maiden, the protectress mother, the old wise death-bringing crone are what kept the circle of life spinning. The cycle is the sacred fire. Thank you guys so much, and a part two will be coming soon, and many more after that. This is the Megalithic Maiden, J.J. Ainsworth. Bye, y'all.